What's up, everybody? Today I'm doing another math book recommendation video. I'm talking about the subject of elliptic curves. Elliptic curves is one of my favorite subjects. It's a subject at the intersection of a lot of different disciplines in mathematics. It's a subject with a lot of rich structure and a lot of open problems. But there are so many different perspectives on the subject, it can be hard to get your footing. I'm going to help you with my perspective. I'm going to talk about several books. They're all different from each other. So I'm starting with this excellent book, uh, Elliptic Curves by McKean and Mole. Uh, it's a book that should be better known. It's a great entry to the subject. Let me just switch to another view for a closer look. All right, Elliptic Curves by McKean and Mole, function theory, geometry, arithmetic. They didn't even have time for an and or even an ampersand. What makes this book really unique and great is that it covers the subject tracing its historical development. So you have a lot of great 19th century mathematics here. The 19th century theory of elliptic curves that the other books I'm going to talk about only cover in a cursory way. It's lots of great non-trivial mathematics. It answers the question, how did they come up with this? And it really doesn't require a whole lot of formalism. This book is somewhat elementary, but it covers some deep stuff. In my math major guide, I was looking for a book that would introduce the subject of Riemann surfaces and algebraic geometry and bridge the gap from complex analysis and algebra, and somehow I forgot this book, but this is the right book for that purpose. So let's talk about what's in the book. All right, so the first thing in this book is this huge chapter about big ideas in the subject. This is the chapter that makes that bridge from complex analysis to geometry. There's a discussion of the Riemann sphere and complex manifolds, Riemann surfaces, rational functions, function fields on curves, their group of automorphisms, even hyperbolic geometry and some topology Lots of great stuff, but it's mostly treated as a sketch. There aren't a lot of theorems, although there is some non-trivial stuff in this section, finite subgroups of the automorphisms of P1. It's a lot to take in at first, and it's removed from the rest of the book, so you really don't want to get bogged down in it. If you're reading this on your own or taking a course, you should only go as far as makes sense to you, and then get right into the core of the book, which is chapters two through four. You can always go back when it becomes relevant in the rest of the book, but it's somewhat apart from it. So the book starts in earnest with chapter two, and it introduces elliptic curves. Elliptic curves are not the first thing that they talk about. They first talk about elliptic integrals because that's where the subject started. So there's this great section in the beginning, elliptic curves, where they come from. So let me just begin there. They start off right off the bat with six examples of where they come from. So mapping the half plane to a rectangle, the central example of the book. There's the rectification of the lemnus gate. There's the rectification of the ellipse, of the length of an ellipse. That's where the name elliptic curve or elliptic integral comes from. There's the simple pendulum. This is probably most people's first encounter with this. If you take a physics course and you derive the equation of a pendulum, uh, most of the time, uh, here's the equation of motion, and they will do an approximation of uh, theta for sine theta, and probably people are curious, what happens if you try to do the full equation while well, you end up with an integral that's considerably harder? And even this example, example six, uh, random walk in two and three dimensions. Now, I wonder if they were aware uh, of a great example of the elliptic filter from signal processing, which uses Zolotarev's solution of a least deviation problem for rational functions and uses elliptic integrals and elliptic functions in a really non-trivial way. That's a great theory. If this book had contained that example, it would have been a perfect book. But this is a terrific introduction to the subject. I really love this chapter. It contains a classification of the elliptic integrals. Landon's transformation, which they come back to over and over, and the arithmetic geometric mean. There's the fundamental discovery that the inverse of an elliptic integral is doubly periodic, so those functions are called elliptic functions. There's a the theory of the Weierstrass p functions. And then there's a discussion of projective cubics and the group law on cubic curves in its original version by Abel. And then Abel's theorem, which is the beginning of the subject of Riemann surfaces, 
uh, what a great chapter. Chapter three on theta functions is another approach to the function theory on a torus. It's connected to the earlier theory. There's wonderful stuff about sums and uh, product identities, and you can already at this point prove some very non-trivial hard results in number theory about representations of numbers as sums of two and four squares. There's even a section on quadratic reciprocity and these identities of Ramanujan that are very difficult great stuff that's hard to find elsewhere. Then there's this great fourth chapter that introduces modular groups and modular functions, mostly centered around the key example of the absolute invariant J and Jacobi's modulus K, which different values of the Jacobi modulus K give rise to the same elliptic curve. And you can start doing really great stuff already with this classifying quadratic forms, there's sections on even these hypergeometric functions and the triangle functions and the modular equations of level two and of higher level. After that core of the book is done, you can apply that theory of modular functions to chapters five and six. In chapter five, there is this theory of the quintic. Now, I bet a lot of you watching this are familiar with this lore of mathematics, at least that uh, the general polynomial of degree five is not solvable by radicals, but it is solvable in terms of Jacobi's elliptic modular functions. That theory is presented in chapter five. And in chapter six, there is some great number theory about abelian extensions of quadratic number fields and what that has to do with elliptic curves that have complex multiplication. This is a nice introduction to some algebraic number theory, and there's a lot of non-trivial mathematics here about the J function. And the only chapter that reaches into the 20th century is this final chapter on the arithmetic of elliptic curves. This chapter addresses the group of rational points on elliptic curves over Q, and it proves Mordell's theorem that that group is finitely generated. Let me mention some highlights of this book. So this book contains a lot of great material and invitations to other subjects and applications. Here is a discussion of the KDV equation and other solitons, uh, soliton equations in terms of elliptic functions. Here's a really tantalizing formula that you can go and try to understand about the roots of that Weierstrass function. Oh, here's a uh, remarkable formula about the size of the largest coefficient of the modular equation. There's just so many interesting things and directions you can go in from this book. Let me point out that another unique feature of this book is the writing style. A lot of math books are just definition theorem proof, very strict, very formal, not this book. This book is written in a very colloquial style, and you'll see that same style in McKean's other books. It's written the way a mathematician thinks about the subject, so it forces you to go along with it and try to make all those connections. So here, here's a really nice part of the book, too. It's Abel's proof of the group law on the cubic. And so let's take a look. Abel's proof. This has to do with the movement of the three intersections of the line y equals ax plus b and the cubic y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3 in response to infinitesimal changes a dot and b dot of a and b. p is a point of intersection if and only if. This function vanishes as it must threefold, being of degree three. It is assumed for the moment that these three roots are distinct. Um, and there's formulas here. It's colloquial and it's non-trivial. Every sentence contains assertions that it's really good to check as you go along. In fact, a lot of the exercises which are throughout the text ask you to check what's going on or compute something nice with plenty of hints. It can be tough, especially if you're used to Burbaki style writing, you may choke on this, but it's very good training because if you can make sense of the subject in this way, then you really understand it. So uh, prerequisites for this book. The most important prerequisite for this book, and it's more so than some of the other books I'm going to talk about, is a really strong background in complex analysis. It's super important for this first chapter, and it's also throughout for the rest of the chapters. Uh, it's good to have had a course in algebra. Certainly you should know about groups. It's helpful to know about Galois theory for chapter five, and it's good to know some number theory for chapter six. Uh, so let me just share, <laughs> this was one of the first books I ever picked up uh, back when I was young and I had first heard about the connection between elliptic curves and Fermat's last theorem. I went out, I bought this book because it had elliptic curves in the title, 
because I wanted to understand that theory and I did not get very far in this book. That's because I did not know complex analysis. I wish I had had someone like me to guide me at the time, but now, much later, I can appreciate what's in this book. This book is probably best appropriate for something that's not offered at a lot of programs, but something like a capstone course at the end of an undergraduate math major, a course that puts together a lot of mathematics. And that's what this book does through the subject of elliptic curves. It connects complex analysis and algebra and number theory. It's got a ton of material. It's a good training as a mathematician. Excellent book that should be better known. All right, now I want to talk about a very different book. This is Silverman's The Arithmetic of Elliptic Curves. This is the standard graduate text in the subject. It's the standard reference text. Everyone who works in the field uses this book. This book contains all of the major theorems of the first half of the 20th century about the arithmetic of elliptic curves and many of the techniques that are used in the subject. So it has some great content, but I have mixed feelings about this book, and here's why. So in the introduction to this book, Silverman says that the major prerequisite for this book is a course in algebraic number theory, which is a reasonable prerequisite for a graduate text in this subject. But actually, the way the book is written, I'd say that this book has another prerequisite, which is a course in modern algebraic geometry. So let me take a look here. The early chapters of this book on varieties and curves and that theory is like an introduction to a certain part of algebraic geometry. But if you look at that material, you'll notice that a lot of the theorems, the proof is just a reference to Hartshorn or uh, another book in algebraic geometry or commutative algebra. Here again, proof C. Hartshorn, and here again. And that's throughout these chapters. And that's something I really don't like. So for the expert in the subject, that's really nice because it means that the book can be very efficient. It's written in the modern language that is used in the subject. But for the student, it makes things really difficult because look at what you're asking the student to do. It's like you're saying you have to take a course in algebraic geometry, possibly also a course in commutative algebra before you get into this subject. You're talking about a lot of material, a lot of formalism from the 20th century, just so that you can study the simplest non-trivial example in that theory of elliptic curves. A lot of the theorems that are in this book were proven without the aid of that theory. I don't like that approach. I like to build from the examples. And so for that reason, I think this probably should not be a student's first encounter with this subject. It's good to learn about what elliptic curves are from someplace else, like McKean and Mole or one of the other books I'm going to mention. But this book does have great content later. So the way I'd recommend going through this book is basically just skip the first two chapters entirely and only refer to them as necessary to pick up that language if it's really needed. Even this third chapter, which really begins to introduce the theory of elliptic curves, which is fine. It introduces the Weierstrass equations and the group law. Everything is proven in this book. It's really nice. There's a, an important section on isogenies. But it's a lot of theory that's not immediately needed. Dual isogenies, the Tate module, the Ve pairing, why all this theory front-loaded. I would only learn it when it's needed. So let me say something else about the organization of this book. Here you can see the, the chapter titles, elliptic curves over finite fields, elliptic curves over C, elliptic curves over local fields, elliptic curves over global fields. Very general theory centric. And so that's easy to get lost about what it is that you're learning. The way I think of this subject is, okay, what is it that you want to know about the structure of the group of points on an elliptic curve? What can you say about it? What are the main theorems? And the main theorems in this subject are Mordell's theorem, that the group of rational points is finitely generated. There's the Lutz-Nagel theorem about the torsion points, the points when added to each other uh, come back to itself eventually. Those points have integer coordinates. There is Siegel's theorem, which says that there are only finitely many points on an elliptic curve over Q with integer coordinates. And there's my favorite theorem, Hass's theorem, which gives you a bound on the number of solutions over finite fields. And that's really important for the whole theory of their L functions. So where are those theorems? Those theorems are in chapters 5, 8, and 9. So those are the main 
chapters that I want to focus on. What is the rest of the book? Well, chapter four, the formal group of an elliptic curve, well, I get very skeptical anytime I see that adjective formal. Formal means only with respect to some abstract algebraic structure and without regard for things like convergence. I have never made it all the way through this chapter. I've been told by other people that this construction is useful for making sense of what is the group law and elliptic curve in some other settings, but I've never had to use it. I would skip it until it's necessary. Chapter five then is where I think the real stuff begins. And so let me go there. Okay, elliptic curves over finite fields and immediately Silverman starts off by stating and proving Hass's bound, which is proven in the 1930s. And so his proof is Here's a kind of counting argument based on the Frobenius morphism and all the theory that's in chapters three, referring to chapter two. That's how it's, he's able to be so efficient here. And then here is the key inequality. It's not my favorite exposition, but it is nice and clean. You can tell that this is a super important theorem because it's an inequality. There's even some more good stuff here about actually computing the number of points itself. In chapter six, elliptic curves over C, this chapter is similar to the material in McKean and Mole. Now, I like McKean and Mole's fuller, longer exposition. You might get a lot of the same stuff if you do all the exercises in this chapter. Chapter seven, elliptic curves over local fields. I have never read this chapter. Why? Because I was more interested in what is in chapter eight, elliptic curves over global fields. And here there is probably the best exposition of the proof of Mordell's theorem. And it's not just over Q, it's over number fields. That's where you're using that algebraic number theory background. And then there's that proof of the Lutz-Nagel theorem about torsion points. And now, in that section, that's where they bring up the material in chapter seven, and that's where they use the formal group stuff. We'll see a proof of that theorem in other books that's much more elementary. I never bothered with that material. Maybe if I were going on and I needed it, I would actually do that. But that's why I skip that stuff that I don't need until I absolutely need it. Chapter nine, integral points. This is the chapter on Siegel's theorem. And what's interesting about this theorem about there being finitely many integral points in an elliptic curve is that this is not strictly a theorem about the theory of elliptic curves. It's really about Diophantine approximation, which is a great theory in its own right. So it's a really nice chapter, somewhat apart from the other ideas in the book. Now, chapter 10, this looks tantalizing to me, computing the mordell vey group, uh, because if you actually have to figure out what that group is, that means you must be doing some non-trivial stuff. Can't hide behind a lot of theory there. Now, I have never read this chapter in full. I'd like to get into it. This is the only chapter I know that uses uh, this appendix on group cohomology, another subject I really don't know too well. All my reservations aside, I really like chapters five, eight, and nine of this book. There's also another appendix of these further topics, which are really interesting. I believe these are in his second book. So this is a great book, but shouldn't be your first book in the subject. All right, so the next book I wanna talk about was also written by Silverman with John Tate, and that's Rational Points on Elliptic Curves. This is in Springer's Undergraduate Text in Mathematics series. And this is a fantastic book. And in all honesty, it's probably the book I wish someone had recommended to me uh, when I was first curious about the subject. I believe it is the most popular book for undergraduate courses in elliptic curves. And it's, it, that didn't make sense because it's probably the best introduction given the interests and the way most undergraduates learn today if, who have a background in number theory and algebra. This is a very good entry into the arithmetic of elliptic curves. A highlight of this book is the exposition, which is really great as an introduction. It's really good for beginners just getting started in the subject, explaining what is going on at every step. The, book is full of examples, full of computations. The exposition is night and day different from Silverman's graduate text. So before I talk about the contents of this book, let me, let's just look at this introduction here where they, they talk about the theory of Diophantine equations and get into how to produce rational points on various curves. And this sets up 
the whole perspective of the book, see how th this is a, so different from Silverman's graduate text in terms of making the questions clear, making it clear to everybody what it is that they're trying to do. So here are the contents of the book. The first chapter starts out with the rational points on conics for some perspective and then shows how the rational points on elliptic curves form a group. And then there are the chapters with the theorems about that group of points. First, the torsion points and the Nagel-Lutz theorem. And everything here is elementary, unlike in Silverman's graduate text. The third chapter is a full proof of Mordell's theorem that the group is finitely generated. The fourth chapter is about elliptic curves over finite fields. Here, unfortunately, they just don't build up enough machinery to prove Hass's theorem, and they prove just a special case due to Gauss. But there's lots of explicit examples here, and there's even material on algorithms, uh, factorization algorithm, and an introduction to elliptic curve cryptography, which is nice to see. I'll say more about elliptic curve cryptography in another book. So chapter five is about integer points and the proof of Siegel's theorem. And chapter six is about complex multiplication and uh, abelian extensions of imaginary quadratic number fields. This chapter is very similar in content to chapter six of McKean and Mole, but quite different, does not prove as much. It mostly talks about the special case uh, just the example of Q adjoint I, but it does contain an introduction to Galois representations. And this is the only chapter where it's nice to have seen ga some Galois theory before. And there's a nice uh, appendix on projective geometry. Really great for people starting in the subject. This book is useful even to graduate students. Don't worry that it is a book for undergraduates. I've come to think that it's really good to know a subject in an elementary way with lots of examples first and only go to the more technical language, more formal stuff when you absolutely need it. So have this book as well and do it first before looking at Silverman's graduate text. So in the course of preparing this video, I looked at a bunch of other books I was not so familiar with. And this one in particular, Elliptic Curves, Number Theory and Cryptography by Washington stood out. And I'm very impressed with this book. I hesitate to give it a full recommendation because uh, I haven't spent as much time with it, but the table of contents, just making a few checks about what's in it, I'm very impressed. This, this is a very ambitious book because it aims to, to take a very elementary viewpoint, but cover a lot of material. So a lot of the theorems that are in Silverman's graduate text, plus a whole introduction to elliptic curve cryptography. So let me just take a look at the contents. So th this is a big book of 500 pages, and it starts out by, in an elementary fashion, covering Weierstrass equations and the group law and all kinds of coordinates, including a nice elementary discussion of endomorphisms, which is going to be used later, discussion of torsion points. And in this chapter, elliptic curves over finite fields, there is, I checked, a, a full proof of Hass's theorem written up very nicely. And then you have these chapters, the discrete logarithm problem and a whole chapter on elliptic curve cryptography I'm not an expert in this subject, but this is uh, very interesting stuff. Anyone who has a credit card with a chip in it is using elliptic curve cryptography. I think that this sh should be followed along with actually programming. And there's a lot of issues with implementation where it's, if you really want to do elliptic curve cryptography, you really need a background in computer science. But it's great to see this stuff together with Boy, uh, uh, the proof of the Mordell theorem and the Lutz-Nagel theorem, all the, the whole theory of elliptic curves over C, and this chapter on uh, complex mu multiplication. Now, I did check, uh, this seemed too good to be true, and indeed, this book does not prove Kronecker's Eugentrom classifying of abelian extensions of imaginary quadratic number fields, but it does state the theorem. Tons of stuff in this book. And just uh, reading through it, it is elementary. It has tons of examples, in, including algorithms and material for computation. 
which keeps the book honest. Uh, this is very impressive. You might want to check this out. All right. Now, the last main book I want to talk about, which is still different from the others, is this book, Elliptic Curves by Anthony Knapp. This is the book that actually I picked up fairly soon after McKean and Mole when I couldn't really make much sense of it. And I got a little bit further in this book, but I had to also drop it and come back to it much later. And I appreciate it much more now. Knapp is an analyst and a representation theorist. So he takes a different perspective on this subject. And in this book, everything is elementary, but there are good proofs of a lot of the theorems of arithmetic of elliptic curves. And it also goes into the theory of modularity in a very serious way. That's the real highlight of this book. It is a monograph. Unfortunately, there are no exercises. So it would be a little bit difficult to use this as a book for a course, but it's a great exposition. And I really like this book. So let me start off by showing this, this really nice overview here. Again, Knapp, like Silverman Tate, they, he mentions Diophantus and his volumes were lost and rediscovered in 1570 for, for Ma to continue the subject. I wonder if he knew that actually 2000 years before Diophantus, the Babylonians had also looked into some of the same things and their material was also lost. But this introduction sets up a lot of the same issues about solving equations in rational numbers. But what's really nice is Knapp has a particular direction that he's going in. And even in this introduction, he presents this really nice numerical evidence for the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture and discusses the role of L series. That's where this book is headed. So let me go back to the contents. The second chapter talks about cubics in projective space and Bazou's theorem. And in the third chapter, there's a, the Weierstrass form and a discussion of the group law, including the proof of associativity. And it's all elementary, which is really nice. So in the fourth chapter, you have a proof of Mordell's theorem. The fifth chapter is on the torsion subgroups and a proof of the Nagel-Lutz theorem. Chapter six is on elliptic curves over C. Again, you see that these books that have one chapter on elliptic curves over C, it roughly corresponds to some of the material in McKean and Mole, but it's different. This inversion problem uh, seeks to attach a torus to an elliptic curve, and that is a difficult thing here. It's, it's treated differently in McKean and Mole because they start with elliptic integrals. And then there's a great chapter on Dirichlet's theorem, uh, which was also covered in Fourier analysis by Stein and Shikarchi. Here's where Fourier analysis is, might also be a prerequisite for this book. But the real stuff that you came for in this book is in these chapters 8, 9, 10, 11. So here in chapter 8, Knapp starts the theory of modular forms for SL2Z. There's the theory of the fundamental domain and the dimensions of spaces of modular forms, the L functions attached to them, and the all-important theory of HECA operators. Chapter 9 is basically chapter 8 redone for what he's calling the HECA subgroups, other congruence subgroups of SL2Z that are going to be needed later. Chapter 10 discusses the L function of an elliptic curve, and this is where Knapp proves Hass's theorem. So here's Knapp's proof of Hass's theorem, which is elementary, but this is where I guess I, I'm forced to admit that sometimes it is good to have some structure, some formalism, because this proof, this is a hard proof to make sense of here. If someone can say the, what is the big idea in this proof of Hass's theorem, I'll be very impressed. You can tell this is an important theorem when it's a struggle to give a good proof, but I, I think that there are better proofs out there. This is one dig at this book. The climax of this book is chapter 11 on eichler shimura theory, how to make this correspondence, at least the direction of the correspondence that goes from a modular form and constructs an elliptic curve with the same L function, where you use all this material from the whole book. This is also where the prerequisites expand a little bit. It's very good to have an introduction to Riemann surfaces before this chapter. 
this is why this, this is a very nice book after McKean and Mole's book. And unfortunately, the proof gets a little bit sketchy towards the end with the match of L functions, but it's a really nice exposition. And the 12th chapter is an introduction to the Taniyama Vey conjecture is how it's called here. Sometimes it's called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture of modularity and its relation to Fermat's last theorem. This book was written at a time when it was understood how modularity would imply Fermat's last theorem, but Wiles had not yet announced that he had a proof. So it, this was not known at the time. I really love this book for this material and its exposition. This modularity theory was not covered in any of the other books that I mentioned. All right, there's one last book I want to mention, and that's Analytic Number Theory by Ivaniech and Kowalski. You can see this is a great big thick book. It is not a book on elliptic curves. It is a book about applications of analytic number theory techniques to a lot of different problems across the spectrum of number theory. But there are several chapters that are relevant to the subject of elliptic curves. So if I look at this table of contents here, the real chapters that are important to us are chapter 11, sums over finite fields, chapter 14 on holomorphic modular forms and the modular forms attached to elliptic curves, and there's even two more chapters, 15 and 16, on the analysis of even more general uh, automorphic forms, and also chapters 22 and 23, uh, which address the class number of imaginary quadratic fields using the L functions of elliptic curves. This goes beyond what is in McKean and Mole and Knapp to some very modern results. But let me focus on chapter 11, sums over finite fields. This is where there is a really nice proof. In fact, the, the proof I like best uh, of Hass's theorem uh, from the perspective of bounding at general exponential sums. The highlight here is Stepanov's polynomial method to prove this theorem, constructing a polynomial that vanishes at the points you care about, and then finding an inequality for its degree. This is a very powerful method that's been used on other problems in computer science and discrete harmonic analysis recently. And there's even a great exposition of all these issues about the geometry of curves over finite fields and the Riemann hypothesis, and even a discussion of Deligne's methods, which he used to solve the Vey conjectures. This is stuff I, I hope to learn someday. This is a great chapter, and in general, this is just a very different perspective on the subject. You just have to have a good reason of studying it because it's all hard technique. All right, I hope you found this helpful uh, and that it helps you find the right book for you if you're interested in this subject. Leave a comment below about any of these books or any other books I didn't cover. It's certainly helpful for other people. If you want more math book recommendation videos like this, just uh, like and subscribe. It'll help out this channel. Thanks so much for watching.